Hello everyone, my name is Brian and welcome to Overland Calling. Today I'm going to be taking you through the battery box, aux power station, power station, they go by a bunch of names, but it's basically an extra battery because I got way too many electronics to be able to use my car battery for my camping setup. It's going to have a power hub. It's located in the rooftop tent. Can run out. Obviously, it's not mounted right now. It's going to have a second power hub that can run out all the way to my awning annex room. It's got USB ports and 12 volt style. It's going to have the ability to charge via DC to DC direct from the alternator slash car battery. It's also going to have the ability for solar panels. Solar panels, mine are portable. So I've just got this box right here, a bunch of wire, Anderson power pole connector that I can plug into my solar panels and get charging. It's going to have the ability to have power at the box itself via USB as well as a custom 12 volt adapter I have for my fridge. Quick peek at the inside. Got a couple breakers set up, got a fuse block, negative power bus, and then a Victron smart shunt that I use to do all my uh, power monitoring, stuff like that. Obviously I don't have my battery in here right now because it's a little hard to see with a big giant battery inside of it. So, if this is something you're interested in learning about, stick around. The one thing the system isn't going to have is a power inverter. All my stuff runs off 12 volt, so I don't need to go with an inverter and worry about losing power as I convert the voltage over. All right, you're still around, so let's keep moving. An overland power system means a lot of things to different people. For me, it starts out with one decision you have to make first. Are you going to go with store-bought or are you going to do something custom? When I first started out, I was all about keeping things as simple as possible. This is my very first power station, Yeti 500X, and it served me well. Went out for a month-long trip with me and my daughter. We just moved this around to wherever we were at, took it in the rooftop tent with us, used it to run fans and stuff like that, and it worked well. But I've grown, um, and I've gotten more things I need to charge. Plus, I, I work from the road, and that is a huge change in my power draw. And I started looking at ways to be able to work from my awning annex room, still have power in my rooftop tent, and of course, run a fridge that I have in the bed of my truck. And that's what was presenting me with the problem. Just want to run you through a couple pros and cons between going with a, an off-the-shelf system or a custom power system. Off-the-shelf models. Obviously, this is a pretty small one. You can get them to pretty much any size that you want now. So off-the-shelf is pretty easy. You just you walk into a store or you order it off Amazon. It's portable. Depending on the size you get, you can pick it up, move it around. <clears throat> and they've got customer support to call if you have some sort of an issue or a question. Cons, it's only ever going to be as big as you bought it. It's very difficult to add new, th new things on, install extra components, so you have to plan things out really well to make sure it'll fit your needs. Typically, it'll be slower to charge via 12 volt charging either from your car or from solar. And typically per watt hour, it's gonna cost more. Not always, it'll depend on what you're building into it and what your custom system looks like, but typically it'll cost more. Now, for the custom system. You can build it exactly how you need it. So you can build it to purpose. It's expandable. Typically, it'll charge quicker. You can determine what type 
what type of custom solar input you want to get and build your system accordingly. And it's usually cheaper. Now for the cons, because it's not all good. It can be a lot of work. And I don't even want to think about the number of hours I've spent trying to learn how to wire things and look at different, you know, what box do I want to put it in? What You name it. I spent so much time on this. I had a good time, but it took a lot of time. Videos like this are going to be your customer service. And pretty likely, especially if you build it like I did, it's going to be a lot less portable. If you're still watching, you're probably leaning towards a custom power system. I kind of break things down into three different steps. First step is going to be planning for what you need. Then it'll be designing it, picking your components and things like that. And then the third step and the fun part is actually building it. So step one, planning. What are your requirements? So one of the major components to think about first is how do you want to charge it? Do you want to do vehicle charging? Do you want to do solar charging? Or do you just want to plug it into a 110 outlet and do shore power? So figure that part out, you know, or maybe any combination of those will work as well. Next step is where do you need the power? Do you just need it in your, you know, in the bed of your truck or in the inside of your car or something like that? Think about where you need the power to go to you. Then you're going to have to try and figure out how big of a system do you need? How much battery power? To do that, you need your average daily use, and you need to know about how many days you're going to be staying put in one area. Another thing is, are you going to be keeping it on the inside of your vehicle or on the outside of your vehicle? That's going to make a big difference with how you're going to be setting everything up in your box. Or maybe you're just putting it, hiding it behind the seats or something like that. One of the big things you're going to need to going to need to know is how much power do you need? For example, you know, what's your average daily usage going to be and how long are you staying put in one place? That's going to determine things like how you need to charge it. You know, for me, I'm going to be staying put in one place for up to five days. So I'm going to have to have solar. I'm not going to be able to carry that much battery weight. Figuring out how much power I needed was one of the most daunting tasks. So I created a spreadsheet. Let's take a look at that and see kind of just how it simplifies things out and just lays it out to make sure you get everything set correctly. So this is the power requirements calculator. First thing you're, you're gonna need to fill out is the battery size section. Don't worry if you don't have a battery yet, just put something in. In my case, I'm gonna put my 100 amp hour battery and I've already checked the manufacturer specifications. It's at 12.8 volts. That's going to give me 1,280 watt hours. Okay, I wanted to go over the terms and abbreviations section real quick. I realized I never really delved into this when I was trying to explain the theory part of things. I mean, it's pretty dry, but hey, I want to toss it in here. So a watt is the amount of power used, and that's calculated with the amperage times the voltage. So if you've got one amp at 12 volts, you've got 12 watts. A watt hour just adds time to that equation. So it's the total watts that are used in one hour. An amp is just a measure of the electrical current. An amp hour, very similar to watt hour, it's the energy charge of one amp of current to flow for one hour. Think of voltage like pressure that pushes this electricity, kind of like water pressure. There's some calculations in there. Watt hours equals amp hours times volts. Amps equals watts divided by volts. Amp hours equals watt hours divided by volts. I've got these built into the spreadsheet here so that it automatically calculates from amps and it'll convert it over into watts for me. Right now, let's just go up to the power usage section. We choose a circuit. 
going to put a device in, put my fridge in there. I've already checked the manufacturer's website and it said 6.9 is the max power draw with an average of 0.9 amps. That's going to be running 24 hours a day. And it's going to calculate, it's going to calculate the total watt hours used. It also totals them and then populates that number into a couple areas of the spreadsheet. Now, right now, it's telling us that we can run the fridge for 4.6 days without doing any charging whatsoever. Well, that's not a good idea. Uh, so I want some way to charge it. I typically will stay in one place for up to five days. So I've got myself some solar. If I don't know what size solar panel I should get, I built in a recommendation section. This is going to be specific to monocrystalline solar panels, though. Uh, sun hours, how many hours you anticipate having sun during the day. I'm just going to put in five there. And then it recommends an 83 watt. 83 watt panels don't exist. I fully understand that. You're just going to have to go one one step up from whatever it recommends. But I already have one. So I'm gonna go to the solar panel size you have. I've got 180 watt, do five hours. And per the calculations, it says it'll do 600 watt hours per day. Now that, that does have a factor of basically 1.5 built into it because it knows that there are gonna be things like clouds and other things where it's not gonna be a perfect calculation every time. So it actually overestimates, or I'm sorry, it underestimates the amount of power that it'll produce in optimum conditions. Now that we have that, we've got one more section to fill out. If you notice, the circuits are have turned red. Um, that's to let you know that there's something horribly wrong. Um, you're gonna, in our case, we don't have any fuse information put in. So we're gonna put that in, we'll say 20 amp fuse and my master circuit that controls the power for the entire box and everything in it, that's actually an 80 amp. So there we have it. Now, if you just got a fridge, hey, easy day, you're done. But not me, I like to use electricity and a lot of it. Um, so I'm going to take a while and fill this in. Oh, no, I don't have to wait. I've got the magic YouTube snap. So this is what it looks like with my system that I have. A lot more than just that fridge. Just remember the areas in gray are the ones that you need to fill in. I underestimated my power. I'm going to up that to five. And I've filled in all my circuit information. I'm actually not using the the fourth circuit that it can calculate. So that's what it looks like in real life. It's telling me days with no solar. I've got less than two days of power if I'm using everything that I've got listed. If I have solar, then I'm looking at over eight days. After you figure out how much power you currently need, think to the future and try and future-proof this as much as possible so you don't end up like me, who just after a year is currently revamping most of their internal components on the power supply to make more room for future additions. So you've planned everything out. Now it's time to really get into it and start designing things. Um, you're gonna be designing everything from the type of ports you're gonna have, where you're gonna have them, any fuses that you might have in there. If your dog is going to eat it or not, um, the size wire that you're gonna have and what kind of protection it needs just based on where you're gonna be using it. The wire here, you've also got the wire inside the box. The smaller gauge wire is cheaper, but larger gauge carries voltage so much better and so much safer. So you want to make sure that you have at least the minimal size for the amount of current that you're going to be pushing through it or the load. 
And in most cases, I usually went up at least one size. Honestly, just so I didn't have to worry about cutting it close on the calculations. Better safe than sorry. I know a lot of these, they, they talk about using you know, discount components from Amazon and stuff like that. I didn't really do that on this build simply because my rooftop tent is gonna be right above this battery box. And if it catches fire, I don't wanna burn alive. So I bought quality products. Don't forget about the size wire that you're gonna need. I'll throw some charts up on the screen with one that's gonna cover the max ampicity or ampacity, I don't know what it's called, but basically the max load that a wire can have going through it. Based on the size wire that you have, um, as long as it's you know copper strand, that's what I went with for everything, that's gonna determine the amount of amps that it can carry. And then the length of that is gonna determine the voltage drop that you'll have. Because as you've got electrons going through here, there's gonna be some voltage drop depending on the length of your wire. And again, there's another chart that helps you calculate that. There's a whole bunch of formulas, but honestly, I have no idea what they are. I went by these charts for everything. And I'll put a link to a, the Blue Sea website that does really good at calculating basically the amount of drop that you're gonna have. One thing to keep in mind, it's gonna ask you for the length of your cable. It doesn't mean the length of one single strand. So like in this one is actually two strands. So I'm gonna take the length of this and multiply by two. I guess it's a little bit easier to see on this one. So the length of wire is gonna be the length of your black one and the length of the red one combined. Before we start, quick disclaimer. I am not an electrical engineer. I'm not a professional at this. I am somebody who has done it themselves, who's going to share what I've learned from my experiences with you. Um, do everything at your own risk. I'm going to go over all the safety stuff and everything I know involving that. But please know that power can be a dangerous thing. It can cause fires. And the last thing that you want to do is have poor wiring and end up burning your car to the ground. All right, so once you got your wire figured out and what size you need, um, you're going to need to know what size fuses to get. Many people think that you put fuses on there for the device, but it actually has nothing to do with that. The fuse is there to protect the wire. If there's a short, you don't want the wire remaining shorted and catching fire. So if you know that your wire can carry 20 amps, then you're going to want a fuse that's below that 20 amp mark. What I usually do is pick something that's roughly 80%. So fuse for the size wire you have. This is probably one of the most important things other than one other item you don't want to forget. If I've got a battery here, and then I'm hooking to my car battery over here. So if I'm hooking that up, I'm gonna to wanna to make sure I put a fuse the closest possible to each power supplier. Typically, we think that the car battery and, or the alternator is going to be charging our camp battery. So you want to put a fuse right here. But, all right, so if something happens here where it shorts, which basically the wires join together or it grounds out, this battery is now going to be supplying electricity to that short even though this fuse has blown. So you're gonna to wanna to put another fuse on the positive cable of this one right here. Basically closest to the power source. If you've got multiple power sources, multiple fuses. So 
there's going to be a lot of different connections um, as the different circuits come into your batteries. If you've got a relatively simple one, you can probably get away with just running everything direct to your battery. I don't have a simple one. So I needed some ways to be able to manage those connections a little bit better. A couple different routes. Common ground. Basically, I had one bolt and all of the negative wires would feed into there. Just the negative ones. The positive ones, I actually handled those through different fuse connections and things of that nature. But for the negative side, I didn't want all those negatives going to my battery. I didn't want them going to, you know, maybe the frame of my vehicle or anything like that. I wanted them to come back to one central point and then that common ground, that single, one single big wire was gonna go to my battery and get connected. So you can either use the common ground or You can get fancy and you can use a bus bar. A bus bar is nothing more than a bar where each of these different bolts are tied together electrically, but you can run your wires in here. Oops, except one of them, one of them is going to be going directly to your battery. So these are two different ways that you can do for your stuff not using a fuse block that you want to run the wires. Now if you're using a fuse box, it's got different things built in. So that fuse box is going to have a positive and a single negative that you're gonna be able to run to your battery or somewhere else in your system. But within this fuse block, you're gonna have different, they're usually spade fuses. Sorry, I know my drawing is awful. But you're gonna have the plus side coming in for each of these. These will be going to different devices. And you're also going to have, I guess I'll just draw it out like that, the negative side. That's going to be the negative of the devices. But the fuse, the fuse box is going to be managing the one single connection to your battery. All right. So, this is going to be a pretty simplified example, but I want to go over basically how you get your power into your um, battery. You're going to hook up to your car battery, which of course is hooked into your alternator and that's what charges that. But you're going to be connecting into your battery. It's going to be coming down. Then you've got to have some type of charge controller. I got an all-in-one that was safe to be in the elements because it sits in the back of my truck but you've got to have something that'll be able to manage that flow of electricity. Um, especially if you've got a lithium iron phosphate battery, it's gonna be extremely important because it's gotta have a certain charging profile. So that's our charge controller. So we got our charge controller. And then coming off of your camp battery, That's what's going to be going to different things. Probably going to have a fuse in this somewhere, or maybe it just goes to a fuse box. Now with this, if your battery has got a smart BMS and is able to actually self monitor its own power, um, you can actually use that. They've got them. They hook into your phone via Bluetooth. I haven't had the best luck with that as far as maintaining accurate readings and getting measurements that are graphed out over time and all that fancy stuff. 
So what I did is in this space right here, I put something called a Victron Smart Shunt. What it does is it monitors the electric current and it's able to maintain that, calculate it, graph it. It's got a great app on the phone and I'll go over that whenever we're running the trials for my uh, battery box. But I, I felt it was worth the money because there's nothing worse than not actually knowing how much power you have left. And when I was just using the battery BMS app, it wasn't giving me the most reliable results. All right, got more and more complicated. We got a fuse box, we got the smart shunt, we got a charge controller. I got a charge controller that also does solar. So when I'm not running my car battery, I'm going to be charging from the solar. And this is kind of the basics of the system. It gets more complicated from there. Um, and I actually drew this out on an Excel doc because I know my handwriting is not the best. But I just want to be able to talk about these different aspects and don't forget like you've got a certain size wire that you'll need for the wire going be between your car battery and your charge controller. Your charge controller should be as close as possible to the battery that you're charging. And then in here, may or may not have a fuse in between here. I do, I actually put a fuse in and I actually run another positive line off of that and go to different components of my system. So it can get complicated real quick, but if you break it down piece by piece, then you're able to kind of get a better idea of how everything's going to operate. This fuse that I put right here, this is my master fuse. It's actually a fuse slash breaker where I can push a button and disconnect it. So if I break the circuit here, I'll have no power going to anything. It does a couple things. It gives me safety to work on anything downstream. I can immediately cut the power. It also gives me a place where I can actually bridge out to different components of the system. All right, I know you're tired of looking at my chicken scratch on the whiteboard, so let's dig in and look at the Excel doc where I've got my entire system laid out. All right, so it all starts off with the connection between my car battery and my DC to DC charger. I've got it wired from my engine compartment through six AWG wire, a fuse that's located very close to my car battery, and then into my DC to DC charger. I took an extra measure of protection and got well insulated wires with an extra outer wrap and then I put a plastic cover over those just because I know they're going to be routing underneath my car and I want everything as protected as possible. I also want to talk a little bit about a theme I have going here and you'll see this throughout the document. So my charger is going to be pulling 20 amps. My fuse is higher than that at 40 amps. And my wire that I'm using is able to carry over 40 amps. You're gonna to wanna to set up this theme in every circuit that you have built into your system. Start things off with your power draw, then step up for the fuse, and then another step up for the actual rating of the wire. And your wire's gonna be at different ratings depending on what kind of insulation it has, of course, how big of gauge you have for your wire or how big a size it is. So just make sure that those three things are in place for every circuit that you're doing. Okay. 
Back into it, we covered the car battery to my DC to DC charger. Now my particular DC to DC charger also has a MPPT solar charger built into it. So I'm able to connect my solar panels in. One key thing to keep in mind is that your solar panel voltage must be compatible with the voltage acceptance on your charger. If this thing will discharge 40 volts of current, let's say, and your charger can only accept 30, it's not going to work. So between solar and your MPPT charger, make sure that the voltage is compatible. Okay, I've also got a temperature monitor. This is actually going to connect right into the auxiliary battery. What this does is make sure that it's not going to be charging the battery if it's too hot or too cold. So that's what the temperature monitor is for. Next, I've got my 8 AWG wire running in through a 40 amp fuse that's located very close to my auxiliary battery. On the negative side, I've got it running down and then into my battery box to a common ground that I have set up. Speaking of the common ground, let's talk about the relationship between a common ground and a power monitor system. So my auxiliary battery does have an onboard BMS, but I, I just, I wanted something a little more robust. So I went with a power shunt that's able to link via Bluetooth and give me a nice percentage of battery left, a trending over time, and last but not least, a approximation of how much time I'll have left at my current power usage. So the power shunt is the only negative connection that I've got going to my auxiliary battery. Between that shunt and a common ground bus bar that I have is wire that's large enough to be able to handle the total capacity for my entire system. I've got quite a few connections running into this, so I used a bus bar to be able to allow me more connection points to be able to safely connect everything and then run them into my power shunt. On the positive side, again, got the four AWG wire going to an 80 amp breaker, which serves both as a breaker in case there is a short in the system. And it also serves as a way for me, me to be able to cut power to the entire system. So this is my breaker slash master switch. From that breaker, it's gonna come off here to my 40 amp breaker, and then route outside of the box into my rooftop tent power hub. I ran it with six AWG wire and it is complete overkill for my current usage because in that rooftop tent, I'm gonna have two fans, maybe an electric blanket and charging devices. Not gonna be drawn anywhere near 40 amps. But I wanted that future proof ability just in case I decide to add an AC or a diesel heater or something like that into the mix. Next, coming off my master switch slash 80 amp breaker, is a wire running into my fuse block. This is where most of the connections are gonna be coming into my system. It can handle up to 100 amps with a maximum of 30 amps per circuit. And it's got six positions. From that, I run individually fused circuits to my camp lights, another one to a little USB charge port that I have on the box itself. I run another circuit to my refrigerator. And last but not least, I run a circuit into my office power hub. Depending on the amount of current that's going to be drawn by these systems, I've set up my wiring accordingly. So 12 AWG for my light loads here with the camp lighting and the USBs, and then the refrigerator and the office power are both using the heavier gauge wire. 
on here, this is my hopes and dreams section. Uh, Starlink, I don't currently use Starlink, but I wanted the ability to be able to have a fuse block that had enough room to be able to do that in the future. One of these days, Starlink is gonna come out with an easy to use 12 volt compatible system. I know it. I don't know it, but I hope it. I hope it a lot. All right, last but not least, over here in the bottom right, I've got my shore power charging. This is gonna be the connection to the wall power. I've got a charger that's Velcroed to the top of my battery. So it comes in through the battery box. There's a 10 amp fuse in there, routed through the wire, and it goes into my 80 amp breaker. It actually doesn't go on the side that I can turn off. It actually goes over to this connection right here between my breaker and the battery. So power directly into the battery. That's why I built a 10 amp fuse in there. Then on the negative side, I've got it going to this common ground, simply because that common ground is gonna be monitoring or leading into my power shunt that's gonna be able to register that incoming power in there. So with exception of this power hub that goes out to my rooftop tent, I do have the breaker inside. But all of these items in here are actually encased within my box, other than the rooftop tent power hub. And then the run out through different connection ports in the box to make it out of there. That's somewhat weatherproofed. Another thing, my charger is located very, very near my battery box. I've actually bolted it right to the battery box itself. That way it's nice and close to the auxiliary battery that it's gonna be charging. All right, so that's the overview of my system. We've got a list of all of our stuff here together and we know the different components that we need. Now it's time to go shopping and then the fun part, actually building this thing. Okay, I've talked about wire a lot. Let's take a close up look at it. I can get it to focus, but. You can see that this is six gauge wire, AWG, and the insulation is rated for 200 degrees centigrade, which is really good. This is speaker amp wire. Um, one thing about this, like, the strand count is super high, so it is very flexible. It's one of my favorite things about it. This is a wire lug connector. The wires inside this one are what's called tinned, where each individual strand will be covered in tin, and then all those wires are then put together. That tin coating makes it more corrosion resistant. Here's another type of wire. It doesn't have as dense of a strand count, so it's not gonna be nearly as flexible. As you can tell, I can barely even bend this one. This one, super easy to flex. This has got a different type of insulation on it as well. This is not easy to see at all. But right there, it is 6 AWG, 600 volt. One hundred and five degrees centigrade for the insulation type here. That temperature rating determines the temperature that this protective cover is going to start melting at. If you want some extra protection, you can buy these covers to go over the wire itself. One, it makes it look super neat, so you don't have just individual wires running all over the place. But it also provides some protection. You've got this semi-rigid plastic one, still super flexible, but it's actually got a really tight plastic weave.
Then you've got this style. This is what I use on the outside quite a bit. It's got an inner core of protection. And then, in most cases, an outer core that goes over that. This will do a lot of your rubbing protection. Um, when I'm routing wires underneath my undercarriage, this is what I'm using. Last but not least, this is some old kind of like heat shrink protectant. I just got a really long strand of it. This does good at protecting stuff. You can see the, uh, the dimensions of it. It's relatively thick, so it'll provide some rub protection. Um, and it also does great as a UV protector. Next up, fuses. These are what I, I call them blade fuses. Um, they go by a couple different names. But basically, right in here, it's a little wire. If too much amperage runs through it, it'll overheat and the circuit will break or blow the fuse. They're labeled on here as to what size they are. You can also notice that each individual one is a different color, which is pretty nice. These style fuses can be used in your standard fuse block. They make fuses that are resettable. Not, I don't know if they do in this particular style, but they make fuses that can auto reset themselves. I don't like those because if a fuse blows, something is wrong in my system and I want it to stop working. It means I've got a short or I've wired it wrong or something. So if a fuse blows, I don't want it automatically resetting itself. So I don't use the auto reset fuses. Now, of course, you see we can use them in the fuse block. You can also use them what's called in line, where they're going to be attached to the wire itself. I like this method. If I'm doing an inline fuse, not going to a fuse block or something like that, because it's very water resistant, they fit in there nice and I can still get to it to replace it. So next up on fuses. A lot of times you'll see these in the 12 volt cigarette style plugs. Again, there's just a tiny, tiny wire in there that's designed to melt when it gets too much amperage going through it. I don't use these very often uh, just because I prefer the blade style much better, and I like the way they kind of plug into the systems. This one will fit in here. Can't really do this one-handed, but just kind of show you. It fits in, and this is how it sets up as an inline fuse. The two ends screw together. These are circuit breakers. It tells you which side that you need to take to your battery, which side to your auxiliary port. So this will be where power comes in at. This is where power goes out. What happens is when it gets overheated, instead of melting a wire, it's got a thermal release where it just releases the tension enough to pop that little bar right there out and that will break the circuit. You also have a manual button. So I call these breakers slash switches because you can physically press it and break that circuit. Use it as a switch. There are two different styles of these. Personally, I like using these the best. They just seem much more robust. But they don't have quite the water resistant capability for every application. This style is going to be much more water resistant. So you're going to put your wire in here. Then there's a little screw fitting that you're going to screw in to hold it down and allow it to make contact. 
It's got that on both sides. And it does have this rubber seal around it to help keep the water out. Works on the same concept. When it's in this position, it's allowing current to flow through it. If it overheats, it'll blow and you can reset it. You can also, which is what I use it for in my application, press the button and manually use it more like a switch. So these are gonna be your higher amperage style circuit protection. So next we have wire connectors. This type right here, these are designed to connect wire to wire. So you're gonna put one end of the wire in here, one end of the wire in the, in the, of the other wire into the other side, and then you crimp down on the middle to hold those in place. This has got like a hard plastic coating. This is the exact same thing, except it has a more flexible heat shrink coating on it. So you can put the wires through each side, crimp it down, and then apply heat, and these will shrink up to seal the fitting. Last but not least, we've got this style. Put both wires through, and then this section here in the middle is solder. So when you apply heat, the wires solder together, the heat shrink is gonna shrink down and allow you to get a good seal with solder. I've never used these before, but I have them just in case. Honestly, I run fresh wire to pretty much everything. I don't like putting more points of failure into my wiring system, but these are what I'll use if I have to do a field repair or something like that. Next up. So this style is made for something that's easy to remove. For example, they can be put into a fuse block. Then you can tighten it down and that'll hold it in place. The downside is if that does rattle loose, this wire can pop out, flop around, and maybe short itself. Whereas if you have this style, the ring connector, it gets the head of the screw, comes completely through it, and then that holds it in place. If this thing rattles so much that the entire screw comes out, this thing, of course, isn't going to just stay there on its own. It'll be able to fly around, but it gives it a little more security. What I usually do is use the ring connectors exclusively and stay away from the spade type connection. All right. The next type of wire connectors are the male and female connections here. Same concept with the wire. You put it in there, you crimp it down. Except the connector here can go into one another and hold itself in place. I don't personally use these very often unless I'm doing an emergency fix because usually when I wire something, I don't have to plug and unplug it and these can wear out over time. But I wanted to show them to you just so you'd have an idea what they are. They also make these in a 90 degree where there's your female connection there and then the wire's made to come out at a 90 degree angle. All right, and then for larger gauge wires. This is a ring connector for eight gauge wire. Same basic concept as the other one we saw. This one though has a removable sheath. So you can kind of see the inner workings a little bit better. So you're gonna put the wire in through here and then you're gonna crimp this down. And this one is a ring connector for large gauge wire. This particular one is for four gauge. And they do come with different size openings here on the ring. This one in particular is 5 sixteenths and it does list it. I don't know how well it's gonna pick up on camera, but it says four dash five sixteenths. 
Another method for joining large gauge wires together is what's, what's called an Anderson connection. So you're going to put the wires in through here, positive and negative. Same with the other side. They are labeled, so just make sure you put your wires in accordingly to which one's positive and which one's negative. And then they click together and they will hold themselves, but you're able to pull fairly, fairly strenuous. It's not crazy, crazy solid connection, but they're not going to vibrate apart. The reason these come apart so easy is because they don't actually have the wires that get fed into these little guys. These guys are what locks things in place. So this is an example of a negative bus bar. The fittings are going to go on here or sometimes they'll have this little sometimes they'll have this little screw on there. You can attach them that way. This particular one wasn't big enough to carry the load that I wanted wanted to put through it. So I've just got it sitting around in the garage. I'll use it as an example. So your fitting is going to go down, put your washer on, lock washer, and then that just screws down on top of it. And then you put whatever other connections here. These come in multiple different connections. Um, most commonly, you probably see them in four. They've got singles, doubles, you know, three, four. You get to pick your size on that one. But you do want to make sure that they are big enough to carry the entire load that you're putting through here. So this bar right here is what's going to be carrying that load. So if you can see this one, the connections are much larger. You've actually got a double thick bar going across and then another super thick one. So this one can handle much more voltage. I think it's 250 amps was what it was rated at. Something crazy like that. But again, just make sure you get these sized correctly to fit the amount of amperage that you're putting through there. This is the power box that I use for my awning annex room. I've just got these daisy chained together, wired up here, a fuse, and then this leads to the main battery compartment where it's then fused into my main fuse block. I'm actually gonna be adding two more over on this side right here to double my power capacity there because I underestimated things just a little bit. Since I'm gonna have all four outlets, I'm worried that one of them might get water in it and short out the entire system. I don't want that to happen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna install this fuse block into here as well. That way I'm able to kind of anchor everything down and each one of these will be on its own individual fuse. Well, I got one of the holes drilled off camera. Now I'm gonna work the other one. They don't really have to be perfect. I just want them somewhat close. Stepper bits are great, but unless you've got the perfect size, you want to be really careful not to go too big. Just gonna drill it out, check it. I need to go one more step deeper. looks perfect. I'm just going to drill out the other side. Got to do that one from the inside.
And I go super slow on this one. Perfect. It's going to give me resistance going in, but not too much. Wow. And I did not do a good job of making them level. That's okay. I know the buyer. He'll deal with it. All right. And then I'm just going to take this little backing nut here. I'm just going to take that backing nut there. And tighten it down. I'm going to repeat the step on this one over here. Now I have all four in place. Close this up. On the side here, I've got both of my USB plugs. Then on this side here, I have my two 12 volt plugs. And I should not need any more power than that in my office area. Famous last words. If I do, I've got to do some rewiring and pull bigger wires for the part where this connects into the battery box. I got to wire all of these in. Just going to strip out my little sections. Let's see how this works. Bam! Magic. Then I'm going to make sure I don't have any wires hanging out. This is the size I need for 12 gauge wire. 12 gauge wire is complete overkill for this, but I'm fine with that. I don't mind overkill. This is the wire I have. Nice solid connection. Just going to take it, measure it out. I'm actually going to go a little bit long. I measured this one exact, but I like to have a little bit of extra room to play with. Cut this off. Throw on one of these and do another crimp. Nice and solid. That one will go on just like that. I've got some extra room. So I'm just going to set it up in here. You don't have to put these on all the time. And you don't have to skip. I'm going to do it just to make my life a little bit easier. I'm going to have the wires coming in right here. That's going to come in. My negative is going to go, or sorry, my positives are going to go right to this post here. My negative is going to come around and loop into this one here. And then my positives are going on this side. My negatives will go on this side. Okay. And here we have it. Got the main wires coming in. I ran a zip tie around here just in case so it wouldn't run the risk of getting pulled out. Positive comes in here. I've got all my positive wires over here. 
my negatives all coming in here. Main negative over here on this side. And then everything wired up. I ran out of these type of connectors, so I went with some 90 degree ones that I had laying around. It's all 12 gauge wire, which is complete and utter overkill. But I'd rather have wire that's too heavy than wire that's not heavy enough. And this is what I had laying around. I'm trying some 3M adhesive tape here on bottom to hold this in place. If it doesn't work, I'll drill holes through and mount it proper. But I'm trying to keep as few holes in this thing as I can manage. I've already got five holes total. So I think I'll skip another two to four holes if I can help it. All right, the new office expansion is a wrap. About all I need is a sticker for my case. All right, so once we've got our wire cut, we're gonna then measure to see how much of the outside cover we need to take off. What I do is I hold it up to the uh, piece that I'm gonna be fitting it to, mark it with my thumb, then I take a razor blade and very carefully score the outside. You don't wanna go too deep because you don't wanna cut through the wires. So I was able to pull this piece here off. I don't know how well it's gonna show on camera, but sometimes you'll see it silver on the outside and that's okay. That's just because the outside's tinned. And if you look in there, you'll see it's copper. So I'm gonna take this, I'm just gonna twist it down nice and neat. Grab my copper lug, and fit it in place. Then I'm also gonna take into consideration this end here and how it needs to be facing. So I know as it sits in my battery box, this end's gonna be down just like this with the part that the wire fits in facing up on this side. On the other side though, I actually want it facing down. So I wanna make sure that when I lock it in place, this is how it's oriented. So this faces this way, this faces the other way. And last but not least, the easiest part to forget is this heat shrink tape that you want to put over it. You've got to get that over the wire before you put this in place. I'm going to put this heat shrink over the wire. Then put this back on. I'm going to use this piece right here. This is my tool to crimp this in place. It's got a little lever that'll lift it up. I'm gonna lift up, put that piece in. Okay, so spring tension keeps everything nice and locked down. I'm gonna hold the wire in. I'm gonna use my hammer. I'm just gonna create the tension on it. You want to make sure you get a couple good wax on it. When you pull it off, see those four indentions there? That way you know it's nice and snug and in place. Pull on it, make sure it doesn't come out. Then you're going to put the heat shrink over it and put the heat shrink in place. When you're doing the heat shrink, you want to keep moving it back and forth. I usually keep it on one side, but I don't just leave it super close. And I don't leave it sitting in one spot. I keep it moving around because I don't want to get the heat shrink um, so hot that it melts. And you've also got the wire underneath it. You want to make sure you don't melt that. So a nice even heat.
And there we have it. Keeps it nice and neat. Plus it also minimizes the bare metal that you have showing just in case anything knocks into it to ground itself out. I started building up a few too many connections on my common ground bolt here. So I swapped things over. I'm gonna be adding on this two spot bus bar. Nothing too crazy. These nuts just kind of hold this cover in place. And then you've got the connections right here. You'll notice none of this stuff is actually screwed in other than my shunt and my fuse box. I do that because I can test this wire size out after I cut it and it's still got some wiggle room to be able to move around for optimal placement. When you're working with big wire, um, it is a lot better to not have stuff screwed down first and just know generally where you want to put stuff. So I'm going to try and do my best to kind of explain what we have going on here. This right here is my master switch. It's an 80 amp breaker. Basically, this is the closed position that'll let the current through. If it exceeds the amperage, which in this case is 80 amps, it'll then trip the breaker. Um, but I use it primarily as a switch. This breaker right here is for the power to my rooftop tent. It's a 40 amp breaker. It is completely overkill, and I fully understand that. Um, I wanted the ability to possibly grow the system up there if I needed to. It's going to have the hot coming out here, and the ground will come back and attach to my common ground. Speaking of that common ground, so this basically ties all my ground wires together. I had too many to really make it feasible to route everything right into my battery. So I broke it out so that the common ground could accept all the leads. This one coming off here leads to my fuse box. I've got this wire right here that'll lead to the power for my refrigerator. And then these leads here will go to power the USB that's actually on the box itself. I'm going to show everything again once I get it installed, but it's a lot easier to see things this way. Let's talk about this guy right here. So this is my Victron Smart Shunt. It's basically a way for me to be able to monitor my power. I started out using the onboard battery BMS, but I wasn't quite satisfied with the way it was operating. It didn't seem quite accurate as I wanted. So I went ahead and made the purchase here. It's got a great app. I really enjoyed using it. I'll include that in the video as well once I get everything hooked up. If you're going to be using a smart shunt to monitor your power, you have to have all of the negatives going in here and then the negative to the battery will come out of this side here. If you connect anything into the negative side of the battery, the smart shunt won't see the current and won't register it. These wires right here serve no purpose for me. Therefore, incorporating a larger Victron system, which I don't use. This connection right here connects into my common ground. And then it's got the positive side, which is fused. This will go directly into my battery. And this connection right here connects up to my DC to DC charger, which also has the MPPT solar power as well. It's the brains of the operation that handles getting all the power to the system. I've got this wire coming off here, which has just got a connection. This is where 
I plug it in if I want to charge 110 into the system. This end right here just connects into the battery. Very important, it goes to the common ground, which then leads to a smart shunt so that it can register that voltage going into my battery. I'm going to have some additional circuits on that on this side, but I didn't want them cluttering this one up. Um, this side's going to have one connection going to my camp lighting and then another connection that's going to be going to the power in my awning annex room. I should mention this breaker is capable of running 100 amps if I need it to uh, with a max individual circuit of 30 amps. These breaker boxes uh, or sorry, these fuse boxes look the same for the most part, but it's very important to make sure that you get a fuse box that can handle the total load that's going to be used and also has the room that you need on the individual circuits. I went overboard with this as well, uh, honestly, because if Starlink ever comes out with a dish that's a little bit more mobile friendly, I'm probably going to be adding that to my system. I want to point out one thing on the the negative bus bar slash common ground. Make sure that your bus bar is able to handle the total load that you expect on the system. The first one I got had the connection size that I wanted, but it didn't have the ability to carry the amount of current that I wanted to. So I had to upgrade to this one, do all new wiring, and make them compatible with the size lugs that are on here. Go over wire sizing real quick. Uh, honestly, it's probably overkill, but I didn't want to have to worry about voltage drop inside my box. This is six gauge wire. This is six gauge. This is six gauge. And then coming off of here, I'm going to be using four gauge wire. This right here is four gauge. And I'm going to have four gauge coming off of here onto the negative side of my battery. The reason I bridged off with the different sizes, the four gauge here going to the battery, and the four gauge there going to the battery, are both going to be carrying the total load of the system. But the power itself is going to branch into here. It's also going to branch out to here. So I've got it splitting the load between my two power centers. Most of it's handled through the fuse box. You just want to make sure that the wire sizing that you're using has what's called the ampicity or ampacity. I don't know quite how you say it, but what it means is that it can carry the amount of current or amps that you're going to be pushing through the system. Whenever you're fusing your circuits, you want to look at what can the wire carry. And whenever you're picking the size of wire that you're using, you're going to consider that and also voltage drop. Voltage is what pushes the current, and the longer you run these wires, and the smaller the size is, the faster that voltage will drop. There's a whole bunch of math involved, but I hate math. I found a nice handy little chart. I'll throw a link in the description. Cover one more thing here with the Victron Smart Shunt. It has its own power cord. It's obviously connected into your negative, no problem but it's gonna need this positive power hooked into the battery so that it can draw power and run its onboard system. Uh, it connects to my phone via Bluetooth and then lets me know the current that's being used, the percentage left of my battery, um, graphs over time and all sorts of cool stuff. I've got my box pretty much gutted right now. This is the lead that's coming in from my DC to DC charger. This lead is coming in from my power supply for my awning NX room. And this lead coming in right here is a very long lead wire. Wow. Is a very long lead wire that is my temperature thermostat that hooks into my DC to DC charger. Then I've got the plugs in here. This one's my three port USB, and this is the plug for my refrigerator. It's kind of a mess back here, but I've got my DC to DC charger. It's also got a plug 
for the solar panels. This is the plug that leads into my vehicle. It's a three-prong Anderson because two of the plugs supply the positive and negative power, or two of the plugs are for the positive and negative lines. And the third plug goes up to my fuse box so it knows when my vehicle is on. I just use these little wire nut fittings to kind of seal things up. I didn't need, I'm not gonna be dropping it in the river or anything, but I did want it fairly well sealed to keep dust and everything out. The tools that I pretty much use for everything are these connection crimpers here. I use these for doing all these type of fittings. These large copper lugs, it would be better to use the hydraulic press and all that good stuff, but I saved a little money. I just got this guy here. This is another invaluable tool. These are what's called lineman pliers. So I can use the flat tips to pull anything apart that I need to. Usually whenever I'm stripping the wires, I'll use this to close down on them. It's also got, of course, the wire cutters right here. These things work really well. Um, it's got a lever action or lever action built in so that I get a lot more lockdown force than I do with a regular set of pliers. I've been super happy with these guys. You're not really supposed to use something like this for cutting up to four gauge wire, but uh, yeah, they do work. And then with all these different connections, I'll put in there what I used, give you a full supply list. But right now, I just wanted to kind of give you a look at the system before I throw it in the box and you can't really see anything. I always save the packaging. That way, I've got something perfectly sized to be a compartment for me. I'm gonna try and use this bottom piece here to brace it in. So I've got everything wedged out for the bottom. Got it cut out here and in back there. So let's see how it fits in. This is not fun to do one-handed. That is not a bad fit at all. And here it is all pieced in. Looks like there's still plenty of room for the terminals. Got room for those terminals to come out above. I think this is gonna work pretty dang well. Now on to the build list. So this is all the major stuff that I bought for this power system. I'm not gonna go through this line by item by line item because we've seen them in the videos, but Milwaukee's packout case. One bonus on this that I didn't mention in the video is that I now get storage on top of it because I can buy additional packout cases and put it on top of my battery box and use that for added storage. Next up, I've got that DC to DC 25 amp charger. I called it a 20 amp charger in the video, but let me just clear that up. It actually does push 25 amps. I got their wiring system. I got their inline fuse. I used to have a SOK 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery and I wanted more power. I was very happy with my 100 amp hour battery. So I went ahead and bought their new 280 amp hour battery. And it comes with the ability to keep itself warm if the temperature drops real low and it needs to charge. It's got some self heating functions in it. And then I got the wires. Um, just remember this 105 degree rating. If you're going to be using that blue C chart that I've been putting up all over this video, make sure you get the wire that's actually rated in that chart, which is the 105 degree or higher. I'm not putting any affiliate links or I'm not sponsored or any of that stuff, but I want you to have a, a list of the major stuff that I used in this. 
some of the small stuff like the screws and bolts and all that stuff, I didn't put that in there. Um, also, I didn't show in the video, but I did actually strap my battery down. And now for the cost. Cost me 2,325 bucks for all this stuff. Then I got my watt hours here. That works out to a whopping 64 cents per watt hour. And if I had bought a power station, they usually run a little over 90 cents to a dollar per watt hour. So all in all, I feel I did save some money. The biggest thing I got was the capabilities. Tons of USB ports, 12 volts, solar. I got high amp charging. The most important part for me was that it is weather resistant because that was killing me on power stations. I couldn't keep them in the back of my open truck bed. I got power going to my three different rooms. My bedroom upstairs, then my kitchen downstairs, and my office annex room. And as I just found out, because I pretty much completely redid most of my box, it is expandable. All right, let's get out of Excel and take a look at this thing as it's installed. Well, we're not quite in the actual wild, but I'm getting ready to take off on a month long trip and I want to upload this video beforehand. So there's the box all tucked away, nice and comfy. Got the power going into my fridge, USBs there, got it locked up. You can see the cords running up to my rooftop tent. Got that little mini hub up in there. And then right under here is where I'm keeping that little box. It'll be much better out in the wild actually using it. But I'm going to tie up this video with that and then get on the road after I load up this, I don't know, probably 10 gig video. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button for me. Subscribe, hit notifications if you're interested in seeing more. Till next time, enjoy the ride.